This is the carnivore designed by Eric Oder of the YouTube channel Oder Limitless and produced by Work Tough Gear. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on this knife, keep watching. All right, just before we get started, I want to thank Vic at Work Tough Gear for sending out the carnivore so that I could share it with you. So as I mentioned a minute ago, this knife was designed by Eric Oder. He has a YouTube channel, Oder Limitless. I'll put the link to Eric's channel in the video description below. Eric is a knife lover and a knife user, so I can certainly relate to that. This is his design, and this is primarily meant to be a large camp knife, capable of all the chores you're going to do around a campsite. Believe it or not though, it still has quite a bit of finesse when it comes to some of the finer stuff and I'll be able to show you that in the demonstrations. So what I'll do is I'll bring the camera in a little closer so you can get some looks at the knife itself. We'll go over its specifications, I'll go over its key features and design, and then we'll get, start to do some demonstrations with it. All right, as you can see, this is a big knife. I had to move the camera back just a little bit to make sure it all fit and frame. So like I always like to do, let's start with the sheath before moving on to the knife. I'll take the knife out, but I will be bringing it back to show you it going in the sheath. So like all the knives from Work Tough Gear, Vic does an outstanding job with his Kydex. Just just no way around it. I, I, I won't go on and on and on about it, but uh, it, all the knives that I have handled from Work Tough Gear, the Kydex sheaths have been just spot on perfect. So this is a simple fold over taco design. Now I do have a pair of piece of paracord running through the grommets around the side. The only reason I have that there is as an alternative lanyard. I'm going to show you there's a few lanyard options with this knife, which are nice to see that you have multiple options. The other thing I'll show you is these D-rings. Now these D-rings did not come on this sheath. They actually came on another sheath, a knife from Work Tough Gear. It came with four of these, but I decided to take two off of that sheath, put them on this sheath so that I could use this shoulder strap for carrying it over my my shoulder. It's not so heavy that you couldn't put this on your belt if you wanted to, if you come up with a belt arrangement for it. I just don't like having big heavy knives on my belt. So I chose to carry this over my shoulder and it's working out very well. I may someday come up with some type of a belt attachment for it. All right, last thing I want to show you is the knife going into the sheath just for that satisfying click. And that's nice, right? It just goes in and snaps in there just Perfectly, yeah. Lots of good retention there. Let's put the sheath out of the way. Bring the knife back into the focus here. So let's go through a few specifications for the knife. So starting overall, length is 13.9 inches. That's from tip to pommel, 354 millimeters. The blade length is 8.1 inches. However, the cutting length or the cutting edge is only seven inches. That's because there's a huge finger choil right here. I'll talk more to that finger choil in a moment. So, oh, so blade length would be 206 millimeters, cutting edge 180 millimeters. Blade thickness just under a quarter inch at 0.23 inches or 5.8 millimeters. So thick, but not overly so. Given the design of the knife, this is a good thickness as you'll see. Blade steel in this case is the SK85 that Vic likes to use as his knives. And I don't find, I don't think anybody can get a heat treat out of SK85 like Vic at Work Tough Gear Gam, hard, or can. Hardened to 5658 on the Rockwell scale. The knife by itself, no sheath. 18.3 ounces or 519 grams. Put the sheath around it and it goes up to 23 ounces or 652 grams. And the handle is machined three, uh, G10 and it's as in two colors, so it is in green and black. And I'm going to talk more to the handles in a minute. Oh, there is an orange liner inside, which is also very nice. And as you can see, yep, I did put a little piece of orange paracord on the end of it. All right, let's go back and take a look at the blade. And we'll start with the design there. So overall, there is a slight drop from the handle down towards the tip. Pretty straight, but there is a bit of a slight drop towards the tip. It's not a clip point. It is a flat edge right out to the tip. The tip is actually quite fine, finer than I might have thought, but still, look at that. There is a lot of metal right up there at the tip. So even with a fine point like that, there's enough metal there. I don't worry that I'm going to snap the tip off with any hard use. The blade edge is flat all the way out. It is a high saber grime. It's close to a full flat grind, but it's still a saber grind. Now there is a full length, well, a three, mostly a full length fuller in here. Intended is to 
light, lighten the weight a tiny bit. I know that's the theory behind it, but while retaining full strength or the thickness of the metal, more than anything, it's an aesthetic look. It does look nice. It doesn't really offer a whole lot of functionality. I say that, but there is one little bit of functionality it does offer, which I'll show in a minute. I mentioned the finger choil. This is the largest finger choil on any knife that I have ever held in my hands. It is radiused around the edges for comfort and it is radiused over the top here for comfort. Now you can see that there is a lanyard hole here. I'll speak to that in a moment. In fact, well, we'll speak to it right now. What's that lanyard hole doing up here at front? Well, for those of you who are familiar with blade sports, there is a style of attaching a lanyard to a knife ahead of the handle so that when it's on your wrist or over your hand and on your wrist, if your hand was to release, the knife doesn't actually go anywhere. It actually stays right where it is. I'm not going to set it up like this. I have done that with other knives. I'm not going to set it up that way today. But here's what's interesting. At the other end, at the pommel, there are two more lanyard holes. Now, why would you do that? Well, this gives you some real options. You can see I put a tiny piece of paracord in here. As much for anything as when I lay the knife down that I can find it again, but I left the loop a little bit bigger than I normally would on a lot of knives so that I can actually put my baby finger in. I'll show you that in a minute. But there are two lanyard holes here, so you can do a couple of things. One, you could put a lanyard in through here, wrap it over the back of your hand like you normally would from the back part of the knife. You could put a lanyard in here and bring it up to here. So the lanyard is across your knuckles there. That's another way. So that's three different ways of using a lanyard on this knife, but let me show you what I did and why. So, and first off, the reason, it's not a chopper. Could you chop with this knife? Yeah, you could, but I don't think it's a worthwhile use of your energy. It is heavy enough out front, but it's not designed for chopping. You can see it actually gets a little lighter towards the tip, so it's not designed for chopping. You can do some serious batoning with this, as you'll see, but chopping, maybe not so much. Not chopping like most people think, but if you do this, put your baby finger in, that allows me to get all the way back on the last third of the handle. So now I can chop like this. Gave me another three inches of length overall on the knife that I can use to chop with. Now, my baby finger is off and my last finger before the baby finger is ripped, gripped around the pommel. So that's the grip that I have on it. You're not doing heavy duty chopping with this. It's more the snap cuts that you can do for taking small branches off of a sapling or something you cut down. Just an option, right? Just an option. I like using it that way. All right, we've moved back to the grip. I have a lot to say about this and it is all good. This is, well, let me just sum it up. This is the best handle on any knife that I've had from Work Tough Gear. And that's saying a lot because Vic spends a lot of time on getting the handles right. And he does an amazing job with all the contouring and everything else. But this for me is absolutely the best. So overall, let's just take a look at it. As I mentioned, it is machined G10. But now well, let's show it, hold it in this profile. Look how thick it is through here. That's what I like about it. It has a lot of thickness right through the center there. It has, I, I don't know, uh, I guess you'd call it a bit of a choil right behind the guard. The guard itself is all enclosed by the G10. The pommel is not so much of a hooked beak that it hurts your hand when you're using it. And there's an arch to the whole handle. It just fits my hand the way a knife should. No hot spots, no sore spots, no hard gripping, nothing. Just the way it should. Yet it still has a little bit of room for movement on that. That's unusual for me to have that kind of room, that kind of real estate on a knife. If I put my gloves on, it just encloses this perfectly for me. Now, here's the other thing that extra length of this does for me. It does have thumb scallops, right? So thumb scallops can be used a couple of ways. One, of course, would be to pinch grip like this. So you allow your fingers to come up under the guard, grab the thumb scallop, and you can do little chops like this, mostly food prep. I wouldn't call this a food prep knife. By the way, I did use this at home, did cut up some vegetables and the like, and it worked just fine. It's not the first knife you grab, but it's nice to know if you're out of camp and you want to use this as your camp knife for food prep, works great for doing that. And that's one legitimate way of doing exactly that is to come up on where the, the choil is, grab the thumb scallop sir, and use it in a pinch grip. Lots of control all over the knife. Now, here's the other reason, the primary reason I like thumb scallops. It's so that I can reverse the knife in my hand for chest lever cuts. A lot of knives shaped like this, I can't do it. This one, I can. I mean, it's snug, but you can see the beak comes at the bottom of my hand, but my thumb is in the scallop, and now I have control. And I'll demonstrate cutting in reverse cut or chest lever cut or scissor cut, however you want to refer to it, and it works really well. 
All right, now the last thing I'll say before we start doing some demonstrations with it is about the grip up here, using the finger choil. I've said many times, and I still hold to this, that I'm not a fan of finger choil. I would just assume the cutting edge come all the way back to the handle. That way, when I put my hand over the knife, I can get the web of my hand between my thumb and forefinger over grip. So there is some width and comfort for it there. And then as I hold on to it, the cutting edge would be as close to my hand as possible. That's what I'd prefer. However, finger choils don't allow for that. You have to move forward if you want to get to the edge up here. So that's what you do. Now, this is where this finger choil differs from a lot of them. It, there's all kinds of room. There's no chance of me cutting my finger at all holding onto this finger choil. The other thing having a finger choil does for a knife like this is changes the balance point. Now the knife is more neutrally balanced in my hand right where my finger is, right there. So it makes it feel a little lighter, a little bit more maneuverable because some of the weight has moved to the back and now it just feels a little lighter, a little bit more maneuverable. That's only good if you can still use it to carve with. So that's what we'll demonstrate. All right, I think it's time to get this knife and put it into action. All right, so this is the largest piece of wood I have for the, this demonstration. This is white pine, and it's dead, but it's not that dead. You can still feel a little bit of moisture in it, more on one than the end than the other. Four, four and a half inches in diameter. Uh, pine normally doesn't give me a problem when batoning, but uh, this might though. Look at the notch through here, and that's exactly what I wanted to see, is what kind of effort it would take to put this through a knotty piece of pine like this one is trying to give it some good balance so yeah it is sitting on a rock down here but I'll be transferring it likely up to this log I just needed to get it down a little lower for me uh, I will be doing feathering and things on other pieces of wood not this because it's too wet for that type of thing all right I span it easily enough and I have batoned larger hardwood dried firewood at home so I have no qualms whatsoever about putting it through this. So let's just get it done. Cover it right across there, good. Oh, it is wet and knotty. All right, that split a lot easier than I thought it did. There's the knot right through the knot there. There's another knot in this one. Now I'm not gonna continue to do this right through all of them. I just wanna see how much effort, if it, or trouble the knots give me if any none all right wow okay so it, that's not a surprise to me actually it's a little bit how easy that went through the knots but uh, yep it's a batoner okay I do have some splits of maple that I'm going to use for the next demonstration so I am staying with my usual uh, demonstrations for a knife just for the consistency and because the demonstrations I choose are representative of most of the tasks you're going to use a knife for when you're out in the woods this knife is capable of more and I'll talk about it more than what I'll actually be demonstrating but let's get started so the next one is to create a tent peg so this is a split of Maple, yes, this is a split of maple. Let me look at it, it is maple. And it's quite hard. So in order to create a tent peg, you first have to put a notch on one end of it to catch your guy line. So I'm tapping in, uh, it's a little bit closer to half than I want it, but all right. So now I'll move up onto the finger choil up here so that I can curve out that notch using the cut I made as a stop notch. It's hard wood, but all right, so simple little demonstration. The point of that was just to do a slight bit of cross batoning was not going to be a challenge for this knife at all. Also to show that you can use this for creating notches in wood. So if, whether, regardless if it's just a tent peg or you're trying to create a figure four trap for doing some trapping some game or any other notch for any other little thing that you're trying to make around camp, you can do it well enough with this knife using the choil to cl close up in on 
the edge. All right, so that's one. Now, of course, you have to put a point on it. All right, so two ways I've could have put a notch on this, and the easiest way is not what I'm going to show you. The easiest way would have been to chop the notch on, and this is actually really good at those small chopping, craft chopping is what I like to, to call it. But I did want to show you how well this knife handles in reverse grip like this. So that's the way I'm going to use it to create the point. So again, I'm in reverse grip, thumb in the scallop. It does fit the hand pretty good. This is a big piece of maple, but let's just see what we're capable of doing here. Man, that's hardwood. All right. I have enough of a point to make a tent peg out of it. So a few comments on this. It was comfortable without question. It's not the method I'd choose if I was gonna make two or three or four more of these. I think I'd go back to the chopping. Reason being is not because again, because of the comfort, but because of where the edge starts up here. The edge is further away from my hand than I like it to be. That means it tends to lever a little bit more. The more closer I can get to my hand down here, the more control I have when I do that scissor cut across using my back muscles. Just the same, it is working. It'll do the trick and comfortably. I can't say that of a lot of knives that they remain comfortable in my hand, but they are remaining comfortable in my hand doing this. Okay, complete a tent peg. But one task I do often with my knives is to do some feather sticking. So let's give that a try. Ooh, I was just looking through the splits I have. This is a piece of maple. It's nice and straight grain, it's very dry. But I don't know, based on the uh, work I just did with that last piece of maple, I'm wondering how well this is gonna work out. I guess there's only one way to find out. So make sure the camera's catching everything. So once again, to feather stick, take your blade, lay it down, and then lift it just enough until you can feel the bite into the wood. Now, here's the thing. Even though that has a high saber grind, the angle is still quite thick right through because of course it is almost a quarter inch of steel. The edge of this is Nitvix Perfect Mirror Polished convex secondary grind. So that's a real plus. It really uh, allows for a nice bite, but it also makes the edge last that much longer. Still, I'm gonna have to lift the knife quite a bit in order to get the engagement with the wood that I'm looking for. And that usually means not the finest feathers, but let's give it a shot and see what we get out of this. All right, I am getting feathers, not big ones. I might try another piece of wood in a minute. I do have some softwood splits. I just wanted to see what I could do on maple because this is working, but honestly, it is quite a bit of work to do this. In other words, I am working to maintain that edge at the right angle, but I am getting feathers, right? Not big ones, but feathers nonetheless. Let's see if I work on the outside edge here and see what I can get. The bark is still on, but get down through the bark in a hurry. Yeah, big knives do normally do not excel at feathering. This is creating feathers, just not big ones, with a considerable amount of effort. I am going to switch over, I think, to a piece of pine before uh, closing this demonstration out. But that's not bad for maple. All right, let me grab that piece of pine. If you're looking for good feather stick wood, you can't do better than a really nice, dry, straight grain piece of pine like this. This is the stuff I reserve for practicing feather sticks on. But it's here and I have it, so let's just give it a go. This was a good test of just how good a uh, feather stick and knife this is overall. So let's just see what I can do with this. Okay, it was different than working with the maple. Wow, all right, yeah. This is a lot more fun, shall we say? I'm gonna hold it a little differently here. I want to make sure, am I still in frame? Let me put that down a tiny bit further. Hey, maybe not the best feather sticking knife, but starting to get some pretty fine curls.
make use of the length of that blade by running it at an angle as I come down. And it's some shaving some fine curls off, that's for sure. All right, it didn't do too bad at all, did it? Now, let's just talk about that choil right there. As I mentioned, I'm not a big fan of choils, but of all the knives with choils, this one has been the most comfortable to use. Still, I would just as soon the edge came back to the handle so I could get back here with the, with the knife when my hand is spread out over the web of the grip. But again, Eric, you did a good job of creating something that is that balance between a knife with a choil changing the balance point on a long blade, a long blade and still being comfortable enough to do exactly this, this type of feather sticking. Actually kind of fun. All right, there is one other task I like to do with knives and that is scraping. So let's give it a go at scraping. All right, first part of the scraping will be what I can do with this piece of maple. I have a little bit of, of wood on the ground there just to collect the shavings. So we'll use the back of the knife, see if we can fuzz up some of that dry maple. And I didn't expect to have any trouble with this, and I didn't encounter any. Let me just cut that off. All right, so I mentioned that there was another way of using the uh, fuller on the front, and this is where it's not bad. So if instead of just putting my finger on the, the thumb guard or the scallop here, I can move it forward and place it in the end of the fuller there and get a little bit of control. A little bit better for scraping like this. All right, so leaves are falling. A little bit of fat wood. Yep, fat wood scrapes well. Collect that up. Now I have my ferrocerium rod. Now, this is right on the edge of being too big a knife for slapping on your ferrocerium rod. So uh, I wouldn't normally recommend scraping the ferrocerium rod with the knife this big. What I would normally say is take the knife, lay it down. Uh, actually, this is exactly what we're gonna do. Uh, lay it down like this, get a good grip on it, tilt the edge forward, or the back edge that is, then lay your fire steel, your ferrocerium rod across the back edge and pull the ferrocerium rod towards yourself. There we go, that was better. Missed it the first two times. So you can see that's an effective way of doing it without smacking your fire lay. Put those little bit of maple scrapings in and we have the starting of a fire. All right, let's see if we can close this video with a few more comments for the carnivore designed by Eric Oder of the YouTube channel Oder Limitless and made by Work Tough Gear. So let's go back to the concept of the design intent for this knife, at least as I see it. This is a generalized camp knife, good at almost everything, but maybe not excelling at some things. For instance, it is not a dedicated chopper. It's just not big enough or weight forward enough to do that yet it will chop in the ways that I mentioned. It is not a fine edged carving knife, yet it still can curve. With a fine tip like that, you can get up pretty into some pretty tight corners with it. And with the choil, you can get up pretty close to the edge of the blade. The high saber yet thick steel allows for some great batoning. No worries about putting this through any size piece of wood. As long as you can span it, you can put the knife through it. In fact, this knife is better than a lot for batoning in that it just, well, you saw, it made the wood literally jump apart. And that's, a, that's the design, a good design showing right there. And I mentioned about the grips. These are some of the very best I have ever held in my hand. Big enough for my XL to double XL hand with still a little bit of room left on them. Yet I still think that most people with medium to large size hands are going to find these still very comfortable. A lot of that is due to how nicely finished and rounded off. That's something that of course that Vic excels at. His handles, the fit and finish on these things, which by the way I'm sure you're aware are hand done. This is not machined. The grips may be machined to start with, but the fit and finish on the end of it is all done by hand. Yeah, it's really a well done knife. The choil 
If you have to have a choil in the knife, this is how it should be designed. Again, I'm not a fan of choils, but of all the choils I've tried, this one works the best for me. And uh, that's just another indication of a good design. Eric, thank you for doing that. Yeah, I really like this knife. Well, all those reasons, sharp spine. Yeah, just a great generalized knife. Uh, okay, I think that's enough for this knife. What I'll do, of course, is give you all the specifications in the video description below, as well as the links to the uh, Work Tough Gear website, so you can take another look at this knife. You might as well sign up and get and watch the site for the next time they are dropped. There's a calendar of when each of the models drops. I'm going to be putting Eric's YouTube channel in the video description as well. You might as well go over. Eric's the designer of this knife. He should have the credit, and he has some videos on his design and the testing and what went into it and why it is the way it is. I'll put the, um, uh, all the comments, or sorry, if all the comments that you have, please put those in the comments section below. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path, let's travel, because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.